so I, I'm going to give you the, the context before handing over to Sam. So um, <clears throat> why are you here and why are we launching this uh, new programme for London? Well, um, uh, water bowl populations across the UK, I'm sure many of you know, I can see some familiar faces on the call, are in a desperate state. Uh, last century, the decline was some 93% across the UK and they earned the title of uh, the UK's fastest declining mammal about 20 years ago or so. And there are a number of issues, uh, are causal issues mooted as, as being part of the problem facing water bowl. But the big one um, is um, the rise of the non-native American mink, which is a very effective predator, not just of water bowl, but many species that live along our river corridors and uh, have been out in the wild since the 1920s and the population uh, has risen ever since. OK, so that's the sort of countrywide situation for water voles. Specifically, specifically in London, you won't be surprised to hear that it's uh, pretty similar, very rapid declines across London. The last big sort of census uh, was completed in 2004 by the London Wildlife Trust. And uh, you can see from the red dot, sorry, it's slightly fuzzy map, the hot spots out in the east of London across the Crane, the Hogs Mill areas of the Lee. Much of these populations we believe have now gone, but we don't know for sure. So there's remnant populations, we're not entirely sure where they are. Other things that are happening, the other elements of the context in, in London are that uh, there are some restoration projects going on. So um, the image here is of the work going on led by Citizen Zoo on the Hogs Mill in southwest London that runs through Kingston. And there's similar restoration work. So this is this is translocation and release of water bowls into river corridors. So both in Kingston and in Richmond. We know there is sort of ad hoc uh, monitoring and trapping of American mink, but it's not coordinated uh, and it's patchy. So there was a need to improve coordination. And um, uh, that that's really where we started this program from. So a, a group of organisations came together last September in London. Uh, you can see their logos on the bottom of the screen. And we identified two first steps. So we're talking about a, a species recovery program for London. So our, our commitment is long term to this. But the initial two steps are to identify where the remnant populations of water bowl are, for which we need your help. So we need community involvement. And that's the missing link between all these organisations. And we also need to get to grips with a landscape plan, landscape scale plan to control mink. And um, there's very positive development in this area is really uh, comes in the form of the Water Life Recovery East program, which was initiated some five years ago in East Anglia, um, where they are um, controlling mink. And that program is expanding and we hope will be coming to London. So I'm going to hand over to um, Sam now, who's going to give you the specifics of uh, this project. Thank you. Sorry, Dave, you can press the uh, next slide, please. Ah, yes. Yeah, so we, um, we've we started the, as Joe mentioned, the London Water Bowl Recovery Programme. Um, so this is a partnership between People's Trust for Endangered Species uh, Green Space Information for Greater London and the London Wildlife Trust. And this was also funded by the uh, the Mayor of London Rewild Fund. Um, so as Joe mentioned, our overall target is the sort of recovery of water voles in London. And so looking at our kind of first phase of the project, we have um, four main areas we want to look towards. Um, the first one, as already been mentioned, is identify any and all remaining populations of water voles in London. Um, where we do find water bowl populations to that is to then support these um, populations and add them to the National Water Bowl monitor Monitoring Programme. And this is the programme run by uh, People's Trust for Endangered Species. And actually there's no, none of these sort of populations 
you know are monitored in London so it'd be a good undertaking if we can get these on board. Um, thirdly is to look at the American mink eradication um, feasibility study. Um, as Joe mentioned this is one of the sort of prime reasons why uh, water bowls have sort of declined and then finally be like an end of, pro an end of project workshop uh, with all the stakeholders to kind of define the next steps work out what the priorities are and sort of springboard from there. Uh, next slide please. Um, so just looking at more detail at the sort of identifying the remnant populations. Um, obviously, this is a, a central first step. You know, there's no point working towards a project when we don't know what the baseline is. Um, so this we achieve through several different kind of approaches. The first one's looking at um, or assessing the current baseline of data from the last five years. So this, this is looking at data from and provided by Giggle and kind of assessing them, seeing what, you know, where the likely sort of records are. Um, we'll also be contacting local authorities and NGOs just to kind of, you know, um, aggregate any kinds of data that you possibly can and sort of put it into one format. Um, thirdly, and this is where you guys will come in involved, is a communications campaign uh, requesting water vault and mink sightings. Um, so this is, you know, really a really important approach to kind of get that wide scale, wide scale, wide scale coverage, hopefully. And then finally, as I mentioned, adding these um, populations to the National Water Bowl Monitoring Program to kind of take the project forward and hopefully see how they progress over time. Um, just looking at the American Mink Control Study. Um, as Joe mentioned, this is you know, a really important aspect of the project and essential if we want water bowls to recover. So the feasibility, feasibility study will aim to address and kind of look at several questions. Um, so firstly is, what is the current trapping effort in London? So who's doing it? How many traps? What kind of coverage you know, is currently there? Um, and then from there, we can kind of work out, okay, how many traps will be required? Where will we need to, where will we need to, where will we need to put the traps? Um, who will manage the traps? Um, like the costs involved and also how to link it to the wider scale approach. So linking it to other kind of landscape um, mink eradication programs so that we can eventually, you know, remove mink from, uh, from the UK. Next slide, please. Um, so just looking at our current sort of baseline records, you can see the number of dots and the kind of distribution of dots is a lot less than the map that Joe um, showed earlier. Um, so, you know, there's a clearly need, clearly a need for lots more data to come in to kind of work out, you know, is this is this just a result of the population decline or is it a result of lack of data? Um, so, yeah. The data that comes in will be essential in sort of, you know, springboarding us on the next steps of the project. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so how can you guys help? So the main thing is, you know, increasing the number of sightings or number of uh, entries, spreading the awareness of the of the sightings portal and just increasing the amount of data that comes in, you know, as much data and, and as much covered as we can get is really important. Um, there'll be opportunities later on in the program where you can kind of join with a with the more formal um, national water vol monitoring program, and this will be run in areas where water voles have been, you know, sighted and surveyed, and it'd be a good opportunity to sort of get the longitudinal data coming in, and then also um, engage in mink monitoring from 2024. So taking part in the kind of the large scale um, project in that sense. And yeah, just just a key, a uh, few key points um, just to mention before people go off, um, you know, looking for water bowls. Um, obviously, we want you all to be safe when you're out there. So make sure you go out in groups of, you know, at least two people. Um, you know, if you're going out on your, on your daily walk and you happen to see a water bowl, then obviously, by all means, just record it as you would normally. Um, if you're going on, you know, on non uh, publicly accessible land, make sure you always have the landowner's permission. Um, avoid going too close to the riverbank and also avoid giant hogweed. It's uh, an invasive plant species that is it's, uh, quite recognisable when it's in full bloom. It can be up to three metres in, in height um, and can be dangerous if you get the sap on your skin. So that's it's kind of uh, fairly straightforward safety points. But if you do want any more information, then just go onto the People's Trust for Endangered Species website and go onto the Health and Safety tab. Yep, yeah, next slide, please. So I'll just hand over to um, Emily now, who will share some details on how to ID. Oh, 
<clears throat> cool. Thanks, Sam. Um, I'm just trying to share my screen. I'm just waiting for my Wi-Fi to catch up. I think it's doing it. Um, is that working for everyone? Is that, is that good? Yeah, all good. Cool. Um, so yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, it's a good introduction just to the the wider project, but I'm gonna just talk about um, field signs of water bowls. Um, so lots of pretty pictures of water bowls coming up. Um, nothing too, hopefully, too complicated or difficult um, for you to take in on a Monday evening. Um, so I'm Emily and I'm working with the People's Trust for Endangered Species, um, so I'm the Waterfall Officer, and yeah, we're delighted to be part of this project um, to hopefully bring waterfalls back into London. So the waterfall, if you don't know what they are or what they look like, uh, that's one there and they're the UK's largest bowl, uh, about the size of a guinea pig. Usually we kind of describe it about that. They can be a bit bigger or a bit smaller, um, but yeah, they're quite quite a large um, rodent. So in England, they've got a reddish brown coat, um, but actually in Scotland, they've got this darker brown slash black coat. Um, but yeah, down in the south, especially, you're going to get the sort of more reddish brown uh, waterfalls. So they've got these small rounded ears, which are kind of tucked beneath fur. You don't really see the ears. They're very fluffy as well, so they don't stick up. They're not pink or um, kind of very distinguished. Their noses are quite sort of blunt um, and again, quite brown, quite dark. Their, their eyes are kind of dark as well. So they've got these features that aren't overly dis like distinctive, I guess. They've just got sort of a like a bland, um, darkish. Uh, face um, and then a, a short fairy tail. Um, so they will dive into water when alarmed which is a really key distinctive feature of a water vole because uh, compared to rats um, they don't tend to dive into water when they are alarmed. So when you're looking at an actual water vole in front of you you're not just looking for these physical features you're looking at that behaviour as well. So when we're talking about the ears and the nose um, you know we know that that rat on the top has pink pointy ears, quite a pointy nose. When you see them next to each other, they look very different. Um, they don't look anything alike, really. Their ears and their their face shape is very different. Their tails are much longer, um, whereas the water bowl's tail is, is really short. Um, but also rats will tend to scurry up the bank if they are alarmed by you see, like if they see you, um, they'll tend to sort of dash into vegetation. Whereas water bowls, if they're on the bank, they will usually dive into the water and like swim underwater to get away from danger. So some nice pictures of some sort of optimal water bowl habitat um, <clears throat> on the left, but they can be quite adaptable. Um, and in London, I, I imagine we're gonna see them adapting to, to slightly different, more sort of urban suburban river systems. Um, but yeah, and they are purely herbivorous. So they rely on these well vegetated, diverse uh, habitats. So 227 plants have been recorded at feeding sites. This number 227 comes up in all the textbooks. I think somebody has been feeding them like hundreds of plants, but yes, they basically eat anything. Um, sometimes in the autumn, um, we find that they are eating sort of mollusks, snails, shellfish, um, small fish even. We find sort of empty snail shells uh, on the rafts that we put out to monitor them. And we think maybe it's just a, a, an attempt to get a bit of extra protein. So they like slow flowing rivers, streams, ponds, uh, lakes, canals, reed beds, all of which offer shelter, food and a place to nest or burrow. So the banks of the river, um, tend to need to be sort of a 45 degree angle uh, as long as they can build a burrow system into it essentially. Anything that's uh, sandy or heavy clay that they can't burrow into uh, is not going to be ideal. Um, so let's look at some cute baby waterfalls pictures. Um, they breed prolifically so you know they have 25 plus babies apparently between March and September which is uh, quite incredible. They will have litter after litter so they'll have three to five litters. Um, the females will be absolutely exhausted by the end of their first sort of breeding year um, because their gestation period is 20 to 30 days but actually 
what happens is once they've given birth, for some females after an hour of giving birth, they will release a hormone uh, to signal to a male to come back into the burrow and mate with her. So she can literally be um, gestating whilst lactating her like other batch, which is just, just relentless. It's just on and on and on all through the summer. Um, and some of those that are born sort of early in the spring, they may go on to actually have their first uh, offspring in the first year, uh, but most of them will overwinter and then they'll breed in their in their second year. The wild life expectancy of the water is about five months because there's this huge winter drop off. Um, a lot of them don't survive the winter, so they don't actually hibernate. Um, they need food through the winter and they need kind of shelter from predators. So it's quite a tough life. Um, they because they need to kind of keep up their fat stores. There's flooding in the winter. Um, yeah. And then some of our water voles in this country and a lot in Europe are fossorial, which means they live underground. Um, apparently they can be found like pests in parts of Europe, which is a bit of a shame because I'd love to see that many water voles. Apparently there's sort of hundreds living in arable fields and causing all sorts of problems because they dry out the soil. Um, you know, they make it kind of unusable. So unfortunately they are seen in a different perspective in, in other countries. In Glasgow, Glasgow, there are actually a few populations of grassland based water voles. Um, and there's no water around as well. They're just um, next to a housing development. So they're just living in, in the grassland. There's people, there's dogs, there's, um, yeah, the, the grass is occasionally managed around the area, but yeah, the water voles are, are doing fine. Um, so just quickly before we go on to the field signs and what we're looking for, sometimes people ask me, like, what is the what is the point of a water bowl? Um, why do we need them? Why do we have them? Why should we save them? Um, well, they are native. They are native to England and Scotland and Wales. They have very um, interesting kind of influence on the natural environment. So they are what we call ecosystem engineers. They will transform and change the habitats around them to make them better for other wildlife, other flowers and plants and trees will kind of adapt because water voles are there and ecosystems are generally healthier when there are water voles around. So they can actually keep waterways fairly clear and they will control the plant life. They'll prevent kind of domination of single species. Um, they'll kind of control the grass growth and the nettles so that there aren't so many same, you know, species of the same thing. Um, and of course, like many other animals, they will spread seeds and disperse, disperse rhizomes and help with sort of plant generations and things. So I've got something in my throat and I'm going to have to have a sip of my squash. I feel like I'm talking too fast as well, so that's probably why. So um, I always like to think of water voles farming their own crops. So their burrowing behaviour actually dries out the soil. And this has actually been proven to promote the microbial activity, um, which actually regulates the availability of the nutrients for the plant growth in the soil. So their burrowing activities um, actually influence the healthiness of the bank itself. Also, not forgetting, they are a prey animal and they do feed many predators not only the American mink, which we don't really want them to be feeding, but also our native animals as well. So we've got herons, um, other, you know, birds of prey will eat water voles. They're a perfect protein bar, so they're much bigger than other voles and, you know, a nice sort of size for, for dinner. There's some cute water vole pictures now. Um, when you see a water vole swimming, they are very fast, they're very buoyant, they make this kind of loud plop sound when they jump into the water and I always like to think of them as like a little rugby ball kind of floating through the water. When they're on the banks they do look like little kind of guinea pigs just kind of munching away on vegetation as well. They sit on their haunches and they kind of munch on stems and stalks and things. So on the banks uh, if you want to find sort of active water vole signs, real distinctive signs that water voles are there, the best thing to look for is their droppings. 
So water voles leave their droppings in little piles, which we call latrines. They're usually this like oval, dark brown to green kind of uh, like tic tacs. They were like wild tic tacs. Um, they are odorless as well. They don't smell like ammonia, like some rats and that sort of. Uh, yeah, they don't smell like really bad. Apparently, I don't always like to smell them. I mean, I, I'm usually covered in mud, like when I'm doing a water bottle survey. I just you get to know what you're looking for when you're looking for them. But they tend to have this very distinctive kind of blunt ended tic tac shape. Um, the other thing is that water bottles may trample leather latrines. So the latrines are usually left in piles in prominent places. But if a water vole is feeling extra territorial, um, they might bring their back legs up to their chests and rub them over their chests where they have these scent glands and then they'll stamp their back feet into their droppings. So they tend to look like the picture on the right, oh, sorry, on the left. Um, so you can see it's kind of like a, a stamped, um, added down um, pile of droppings. And then on the right, you've got the normal pile of droppings, which is what your kind of classic textbook water bottle dropping looks like. Um, so you're looking for both really. And sometimes you're wondering like, why am I just looking for a pile of mud? <laughs> um, it's really hard to see. So usually, hopefully you'll find both, um, but you can just find this, the, the type on the left. Um, you just have to get your eye in to make sure that you're confident with your identification. You can always take photos and let us know, take photos and then just send it to us and just ask, you know, is it a water bottle dropping or? or not. Um, yeah, so in terms of size, um, I just popped a 5p piece there. So they they are small, but I wouldn't say they're, they're absolutely tiny. I've got some pictures of field vole droppings that I'll share in a moment that have put next to a 5p piece and they're even even smaller. So they're not they're not sort of the size of rice. They they are tic tac sized. Um, they're usually left in quite a prominent place, which is handy, but they can be hidden kind of beneath vegetation or in a burrow entrance. So you just have to kind of part the vegetation as much as you can to see to see and, um, you know, see down to the, the soil because they like to leave it near the water's edge as well. So sometimes being as safe as possible. Um, we don't always recommend sort of leaning over, but if you can kind of get as close to the water's edge as possible, that's where you're more likely to see them. Um, so these are latrine rafts. Uh, these are things that we put out specifically to monitor water voles um, and they will latrine on them. So they're very handy because water voles love to poop in prominent places. So putting out a raft for them on purpose is just a really good like idea because you can easily see them from the bank. You can use binoculars. You don't have to trample down the bank. You don't have to damage the vegetation, you can just look from the footpath or from the bank um, and you can easily say yes or no that there's presence without having to cause any disturbance or kind of, you know, getting down into the water or anything like that. So it's safe um, and it's time effective as well because you can just walk along the bank and kind of monitor each raft uh, without having to sort of check between all the vegetation. So they're really useful for many different uh, reasons for monitoring water voles. They'll also leave their feeding signs um, on the banks, which uh, on the rafts, which is what you can see on the right picture. They've left a pile of um, reed uh, stalks and leaves in and amongst their, their latrines. So that looks a little bit messy. So that's it for the droppings. Um, so we'll go on to the feeding signs now. So water voles like to feed in particular places. They make their own little feeding stations along the banks, usually somewhere quite sheltered, not usually where they latrine, but they can sometimes, especially on the rafts, they will feed and latrine on, at the same time. But they're usually quite neat. They'll leave these piles of chewed vegetation, tend to be sort of uh, like five, six, ten centimetres long. They can be longer, um, depending on what they're eating. If they're eating something really um, thick, then they will kind of leave longer sections and come back later for the other sections. They tend to always have this 45 degree angle, this cut to their end, because they nibble them at a sort of slanted angle. So as you can see on the left, they've got this classic 45 degree angle and not many other animals will leave piles of 
stalks and stems by the riverbank with that particular kind of angular cut, apart from field bowls, and we'll go on to that as well. So they tend, water bowls will tend to eat leaves, grasses, reeds, sedges, rushes, anything leafy and green, they'll eat it. Um, they have been known to eat, or they, they do eat, because I see it a lot, they eat hemlock water dropwort, which is a very poisonous um, plant. And there's, there's a lot of it down here where I live in Chichester. Um, and they'll eat it. And apparently the only other animal that people sort of seem to eat it a lot are, are goats, sometimes cows. Um, I don't think there are many other animals that eat it. So they basically need to eat anything. And in the winter, they'll choose to eat kind of roots and they'll gnaw on tubers and bark of trees. So they've got really strong teeth. Uh, their teeth, their front sort of insides are coated with ferrous oxide, which is essentially iron. So their teeth are actually orange. Extremely sharp teeth. Extremely sharp. Don't don't ever pick up a water bowl without wearing gloves um, because they will bite down to the bone if they want to. Um, they also love berries and other fruits, so blackberries, apple. They absolutely love pink lady apples, apparently. Oh. Have I lost my thing? All good. Oh, no, yeah. Um, so we're on to um, the feeding signs. So we've got a culvert here, which had a, a latrine on it, as you can see at the top, and then they've left this stalk of hemlock water dropwear on the left. Um, and it's got that classic sort of 45 degree angle, and it's just quite neat and tidy. Um, whereas rats will kind of leave their droppings along runs and the runs will be quite messy and quite sort of well-worn. Water bowls are quite neat and generally quite sort of fussy about where they leave their food as well. They're usually in like a good pile um, and they're usually quite fresh as well, especially at this time of year. All the feeding signs you'll find are kind of fresh and green. But then come the autumn, you've got dried grasses and dried sort of rhizomes and things so they can look a little bit more like aged so you just got to get your eye in. Um, some pictures just from a reed bed just a kind of different feeding station as you can see the stalks are quite long and then in the hand you can just see that angle the 45 degrees. Um, so here's some signs of uh, field voles. So the feeding signs are fairly similar. As you can see, they kind of eat at this angle, but the stalks that they leave are so much shorter and they'll leave piles and piles of these tiny little stalks that are just left, um, you know, near their burrows. Sometimes they will leave them like five or six centimetres long, and in which case you just have to look for other signs and make sure that it's not a field vole. Um, on the right is their latrines so they will leave these rice grain sized latrines near their burrows and and sometimes on riverbanks which can be confusing but it is so much smaller than a water bowl you know latrine that was much much bigger um if you just try and imagine it's if it's a tic tac or not um without trying to bite it then yeah <laughs> it's usually most helpful so on to waterfall burrows um you know, they're a really key feature of water voles, but don't always take holes in the bank as as gospel for for being a water vole burrow. Holes in the bank can usually be many can be any other things. So it's always good for look to look for other features as well. Um, but generally, water vole burrows tend to have this little nibbled lawn at the entrance. So um, the photo below, I actually took that this afternoon at one of my sites, and the water voles have nibbled quite a few of the grasses on the outside of the burrows and they've got this like neat neat and tidy sort of like entrance um and also the paths or the, like outside of the entrance of the burrow there are these paths and slopes that lead to the water whereas generally with the rat runs we and rat burrows we tend to get the paths leading up away from the water so they lead like up and over the bank rather than straight into the water um unless like the rat run is opposite a pub or something where we've had before the rat burrows are just literally facing somebody's garden or some or a pub 
the rats will go straight across the water into the pub garden. Um, of course, we wouldn't blame them, but generally water vole burrows have this like slope down. The burrows will go up to six metres or, or maybe more into the banks. It's kind of a complex network of tunnels and chambers in there. They've got feeding chambers, maternity chambers, sleeping quarters. Um, yeah, they're very homely and very cosy. And what you've got to look out for as well is some of the entrances are on top of the bank. So they're, they're what we call sort of bolt holes or escape holes. Um, you know, they do come up onto onto the bank a lot of the time to feed. So to have vertical entrances as you're looking down onto the bank, you know, just look out for any holes that are sort of look like they're going nowhere, but they might actually lead down straight into the burrow. So they're not always side on. So just a couple of pictures of brown rat burrows, um, quite distinctive, just kind of they have this cleared rat run between each burrow entrance, um, whereas with the water bowl, there are runs, but they're not as obvious and they don't kind of wear them down. Um, so and the rats will often leave their droppings along the runs and there might be a smell of ammonia. So it's usually quite distinctive once you've um, seen one. And then for the field vole burrows, um, which you can find along riverbanks and pretty much anywhere in any grasslands uh, in England, they have this nibbled lawn similar to the water bowls. They tend to be vertical burrows, um, but also they're not much bigger than a 2p coin, so they're hopefully very distinctive. Um, they are really, really tiny. They're pretty much not, they're never usually wider than, you know, your your finger or your thumb. Um, so yeah, just just to reiterate what I mentioned earlier, the holes are in the bank are not a definitive sign of water bowls, unfortunately. Um, if there aren't any other field signs and all you've found is holes, then you need to consider what else could have made those holes. So there's lots of other creatures that can make holes near or on the riverbanks, like rats and other voles, sand martins, which is what's in that picture, kingfishers. Rabbits, badgers will snuffle, make snuffle holes looking for earthworms and there might be old pipes and culverts that have been overgrown, but they look like a hole. So, yeah, if you find holes, it's generally good to investigate more, look for other field, field signs and then. Um, yeah. <clears throat> if there are no banks available. Then water vaults will sometimes make what we call aerial nests and um, they might make reed bed uh, nests or nests made of grass um, and they'll kind of be up on top of the the water but not high like a bird's nest or anything it's kind of low down um, and yeah I mean they're really hard to find if you're not in the reed bed itself so I don't really recommend you going into the reed beds because you can just damage a lot of the reeds anyway but yeah it's just an interesting fact to, to know and obviously if you if you are in the water and you can see into the reed beds then you can have a look but yeah we don't tend to recommend that people go wandering through the reed beds because they're quite a fragile habitat um and yeah another another sign of water vole which is quite sort of not it's not very distinctive but if there are other signs around like latrines or feeding signs or burrows gnawed bark and gnawed roots can be quite a good sign um, they will climb on things to get to gnaw the bark um, or they'll try and reach honeysuckle and that sort of thing, especially over the winter when there's lack of food. So they'll go up higher just to have a, a nibble on certain, certain things. But this was opposite um, a burrow with a latrine and then we noticed this and I was like, oh, it's really interesting to see because I'd not actually seen that before, but I've read it quite a lot before. So hopefully you can see now all of those differences that we mentioned at the start. Um, we've got the water bowl on the left, obviously, and the rat on the right with those pink ears and the pink feet and the pink, pinkish sort of tail um, and those sort of pointy nose. The water bowl has, um, yeah, just quite a, a rounded face and rounded ears. So I'm also going to quickly mention some of our 
most distinctive sort of mink signs. Um, mink are really elusive animals. You're not very likely to see them during the day, um, although I have seen them at midday. Um, they're meant to be sort of dawn dusk hunters, but I think they've just adapted to hunt any time. <laughs> they have this um, blackish dark brown fur. Um, they're very ferret-like with their body as well, the way they move, um, the way they hunt. It's very ferret-like. They look very similar to polecats and pine martens, but they just don't have as much white features. Um, and I think they're, yes, they they just look quite similar, basically, but they just don't have um, the white sort of chest, um, but they do have a white chin sometimes, the mink. Um, the mink scat can be very unpleasant to smell. Don't go near it with your nose, um, but it does smell horrible. It's quite black and tarry they eat anything really so it will have bones and fur in it ten generally or scales but generally bones um and it's quite a twisted scat as well it kind of has this like twisted tapered shape um so, and so it's usually left in kind of a, a horseshoe shape but it can be kind of any size depending on what they've eaten yeah it, it varies quite a lot in, in how it looks and the footprints, which we tend to only see on our rafts or in really soft mud, um, they kind of look like cat footprints in the size, maybe a bit smaller. They are really small, about three or four centimetres wide. So I guess if you've got a really small cat, it might look like that, but they'd have five toes. So that's the difference. Um, they are really light and um, you know, they try to be effective predators, so they don't leave a massive imprint in harder mud. They they only really tend to leave a footprint in kind of really soft mud or snow. So, yeah, unfortunately, they are kind of cute, but you just have to look past that. And I'm not going to look um, too much into uh, mink eradication today, but... Um, this is a mink raft um, and the waterfowls have been using it to latrine on. Good for them. Just try and get rid of the, the mink for using their own territorial latrining. Um, this raft is, is years old and uh, we haven't ever had mink on it for years now because um, hopefully eradicated them from this particular site. Um, but that clay pad in the middle of the tunnel is where we check for footprints. So you can take that pad out and look for waterfowl footprints, mink footprints. And if you get a mink footprint, you can then put a trap in inside the raft. Um, yeah, there'll be within the project, I'm sure there'll be a lot more talk about mink eradication and yeah, how to use rafts and all that sort of thing. But for anyone that just hasn't seen a mink raft before, that is what one of them looks like. So the National Waterfowl Monitoring Programme is the People's Trust for Endangered Species annual survey. It's slightly different from the casual recording, but if you have a site in mind or you want to get involved and you've got volunteers in mind or you just want to survey a site every single year or you want to add your site as like a, a transect, then you can register it with the programme. So the Vincent Wildlife Trust carried out two National Waterfowl Surveys. Um, in the 1980s and then again in the 1990s at the same places and the results from that showed that there was a 90% decline in water levels from where they once were. Um, so the National Water Bowl Monitoring Programme is aiming to resurvey all of these sites so we want to get that up-to-date data from sort of 30 years ago to make sure that we know what the habitats even look like let alone whether there are still water bowls at these sites that they surveyed. There aren't actually any sites in like central London, but we're looking at expanding kind of where we can add sites. So we need more people like yourselves to add sites to our programme so that we can map London and in, in, into our and bring it into our database. Because, yes, for whatever reason, they didn't survey much inside the M25 corridor, which um, we weren't really sure why. Um, so we just don't have data for it. And so the best time to start is now. Um, so all you need to do is survey 500 metres of waterway and it's once per year between April and June, 15th of April, 15th of June. Uh, you don't need any specialist equipment except this information in your head. 
uh, and you've got the online training, we've got ID guides and we've got advice available all the time. You can send us your photos if you're not sure what you found, um, ask questions. Um, and just to kind of give you a quick snapshot look at what the National Waterfowl Monitoring Programme has achieved so far. These are all the sites that have been surveyed between 2015 and 2022. So as you can see, there's a huge um, mass of data in Scotland, which is the amazing efforts of Aberdeen University um, at all their sites. But also across the south, there have been many, many sites, but there's this kind of circle, the, the, this gap in London um, and in Kent as well. But London is this eye in the in the bottom of England that just hasn't got any sites. So it'd be great to get some sites set up in London. Um, if anyone's got any anywhere in mind that they want to set up a 500 metre transect, it can be less um, than 500 metres if you don't have access. Um, we'll take we'll take anything really. Um, basically, it would be really good to fill up that gap uh, and all the rest of the gaps. But for London particularly, because there are so many people in London to get out and survey um, and so many waterways and river systems that, um, you know, we could actually survey and monitor in order to um, inform the project and possibly bring water wells back to them. So that's all for me. I'm going to hand over to Victoria now, who's going to talk to you about how you submit those casual water vol records. Hello everyone. You there, Victoria? She might be gone. Victoria did have a problem with her Wi-Fi earlier. Sorry about this, everybody. Do you want me to go through it? If you can link to it, Sam, that'd be fantastic. Victoria was just going to show you the portal for the informal sightings. And just to pick up a question, so we had a question from Jessica. Are there any sites in particular in London that you have in mind that we can sign up for? So this is one of the aims of the project is to identify the remnant populations within London and link them to that PTES, the People's Trust for Endangered Species National Water Bowl Monitoring Programme. So it's only the re the remnant sites <clears throat> that will be linked and that and we will offer formal training. So it will be Emily again that will go through training of how to run those surveys. Can you link to the portal, yeah. Sam? So I just share my no. screen now, so hopefully you can all see that. Thumbs up if you can. All good. All good. OK, yeah, so this is um, this is the portal that's been set up to kind of record, um, you know, the water vault data or the the American mink data, sighting data that we get. Um, so it's fairly straightforward and um, links will be shared out, out after. But it basically gives you a quick brief of, you know, information about water bowls, um, the context of water bowls in London, and then also how you can help, which is all stuff we've gone through. Um, so it's fairly straightforward. So there's options, obviously, to read the uh, the privacy policy, um, which I've obviously read. So I'll go next. Um, so yeah, as I said, it's 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 fairly straightforward walkthrough. I won't go into every single detail, um, but you can you can choose. Um, you know what sighting you want to enter is it water voles or American mink and it'll come up with different um, different options or, and different information so you can see here a bit of information about the habitat you're in to kind of classify what you're looking at um, again sort of uh, visual signs of similar species and sort of photos for reference um, again looking at latrines and then if I skip down to the bottom yeah, so it's, it's a good kind of to sort of re recheck with yourself when you are submitting the data if, if the sort of observations you kind of saw match what we're expecting in terms of uh, the sightings. 
So here you can basically, um, you know, declare what kind of siting you're looking at. Was it a water? Was it a burrow? Mink, um, mink, water vault, water vault even. Um, and you can you can obviously click multiple of them. And then again, just walk through the sort of different options uh, when it was observed, when it was observed, and then location uh, data is obviously quite important. So location name, um, you know, the area you're in, the park, the national park, the you know whatever it is. Um, location coordinates, um, you know, if you've got access to your Google Maps, it's quite handy. Or often I say what three words is quite a good tool to use. It sort of narrows it down to, um, you know, a three by three meter grid. So, yeah, so as I said, it's fairly straightforward um, and I'll just quickly go through the mink options. So again, it sort of points out the kind of IDs you're looking for, so, you know, most likely will be kind of the the uh, scat signs or the footprints that you'll be seeing if you do see any. And yeah, what you've got to do is just sort of follow, go through the options. And yeah, take it forward. So yeah, these, uh, it's, as I said, it's fairly straightforward and the links will be shared with you after. Um, so if you do have any questions, I believe I will stop sharing my screen now. Thank you very much, Sam, for stepping in there. So let's have a look at some of the questions. Uh, we have to thank Darren for chipping in with expert uh, water vault knowledge. Thank you for answering those. So um, some people, Nadja has offered to survey a site in Ealing, which is fantastic. So um, what we'll do is when we um, know where the remnant populations are or the, the populate where the populations are in London we will offer formal training so Emily will do that and we'll now that you've come to this meeting we'll have your email address and we'll be able to mail out afterwards when we organize the formal trainings um, what's your definition of London Joe greater London we're talking all London boroughs so greater London it was one of the questions, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Just trying to find other questions that haven't been answered. <laughs> There's a good question from Peter Lawrence about uh, Giggle. Does, does, does the Giggle form allow for negative records? No, it doesn't. So it's so we've got we're we've got two separate reporting um, schemes here. One is just for the informal. You're out and about and you spot a mink or a water bowl and you can submit those through Giggle. So it doesn't account for effort. And separately, we will set up sites which will have the PTES routine surveys and that does accommodate negative records or an absence of water bowl. Any other questions? Ben Stockwell, we have lots of historic data from the Hogsmill River Service. Hello, Ben, uh, including a few records of mink. This will all be useful and please do send them over. So report them through Giggle um, if you can. And also we'll be talking to you shortly, Ben. Do you have to have previous experience to take part in the formal training? That's for you, I think. Emily, do you want to answer that one? Um, no, yeah, you don't need any experience. I mean, it'll basically be what I've just gone through in the slides, but just a bit more detail. Um, yeah, so it, it's, it's for sort of anyone that wants to do any kind of voluntary surveying, um, as well as that sort of, yeah ecological habitat that like, you know doing habitat assessments because not only do we want to know where the water bowls are but we just want to know what the habitats are like in London as well. Thank you very much and then we've got a question from Tom about who does this fit with water life recovery trusts records and really those conversations are developing um, Tom I mean water life recovery I, I assume WRT is water life recovery trust um, 
Yes, thank you. Uh, um, those conversations are developing. I mean, it's a fantastic initiative that um, is looking to expand into London, and we're here to facilitate and support that expansion as and when it happens. I think. And Ellen, so just to clarify, we'll be contacted by email subsequent. Yes, that's perfect. So after this meeting, we will be following up with links to share uh, Emily's fantastic presentation and the portal, the Giggle portal, so you can submit records. And you'll also be notified about future training opportunities that come up through this programme. Um, so thank you very much indeed for taking part. There's some more questions coming through. More offers of help. Mm -hmm. So we'll probably leave it there, but thank you all very much indeed for joining us. And we will be in touch beyond this meeting. Enjoy your evening. Thank you. Yes, we have spoken with Chris Strachan. <laughs>